Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to speak in front of this audience. Um, so yeah, so this is, uh, will be a series of results um, jointly with uh, some people I would like to mention. So two of my favorite co-authors are sitting in the room. Um, and there's also some contribution from uh, Milton and Jan de Graaf and Leandro Chiarin from IMPA. All right, so luckily some of the uh, basic things were introduced, so I don't have to start from the beginning, but let's, uh, yeah, so let's start from the, of, from the definition of the model I will consider. Okay, so consider like V is some finite graph, And in this talk, in particular, I will look at the discrete torus of side length n, which is just intersection these two sets, um, then to each vertex in my graph, I assign Height. height, and I say height um, because you see I'm allowing my heights to be po this is R to be positive and negative numbers. So as the Lionel said in his introduction, positive numbers um, would correspond to a mass which is present at a certain vertex, and negative numbers uh, you can imagine as a whole which is present, okay? And then a divisible sand file configuration is a map from V to R such that to each X I'm assigning a height, okay? Uh, all right. So this is, so the divisible sand pile is um, like a continuous version of the Abelian sand pile. So you can see I'm working in R here. Um, and it is not dissipative as the Abelian sand pile. So it is a fixed energy sand pile. This is also another expression for it. It means it, um, the mass is conserved. Okay? So no dissipation. Uh, conservation of mass. Sorry? Yes. So, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, ah, okay. I will come to this uh, in a minute. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, now, and so I want to introduce some dynamics. So I'm starting in the init uh, initially with some random configuration um, at each vertex uh, of my graph. And now I want to do some deterministic dynamics. Um, in the following sense that if at some discrete time t, the height at time t, so this is just s t at uh, x, so, so this height at time t in my vertex s is larger than one, then what I do, I keep mass one and redistribute um, the excess, so the s t minus one for the positive part, I can do it in two ways. So the first way will be the nearest neighbor way, which means that I'm redistributing the excess just equally among the nearest neighbors. And so uniform, uh, among nearest neighbors. And I will consider a long-range case 
um, which means that I'm redistributing the excess not only to the nearest neighbors, but to everybody. And the um, vertices which are far away will proportionally get less than the vertices which are close. So it's proportional to the distance of uh, 2x. So distributes according to like a long range random walk. Okay, we'll make this more precise in a minute. All right, and, and then I continue. Okay, let's see an example. All right, so let's say I have at some point mass five, and I will start with uh, discrete, just to make it easier. Um, I have at some um, point mass, high, uh, mass five, and here I have, for example, mass one, and here I have minus ones, also minus ones, etc. So this is like one possible initial configuration. Okay? Now, so let's for the example stick to the nearest neighbor model. Uh, so you see this side, okay, green, this side is unstable because its height is larger than one. Okay? So what do I do? I have to, in doing the nearest neighbor case, I will redistribute the mass equally among each neighbor and I'm keeping mass one. So this Neighbors will get height two. They are staying the same. So I don't care what happens now here in the rest of the lattice. I just want to locally show you what's going on, uh, etc. Okay? So this is at uh, first times. Now you see still there are some unstable sides. So those ones. Um, so I'm doing again. I'm redistributing. I'm keeping mass one and redistributing. Um, the excess equally among each neighbor, so this side will get one quarter from each neighbor, so we'll go back to two, this one will have ones, and this hole will be filled, it will get a half from this so, uh, quarter and quarter, so in, in total a half, from neighbor, and so on. And this will get a quarter. Okay, so, and, okay, and so on and so on, okay? Is, is it more or less clear? <clears throat> All right. So you, <clears throat> again, so you're starting with some random configuration, then you're doing the dynamics, so you are checking every side if the height is larger than one or not. If it's larger than one, then we will topple, and you can again ask yourself, does the order matter? Well we will see that under some conditions the order will not matter, so let's say we topple all in parallel. So all unstable sites at time t, fixed time t, are toppled in parallel, so by redistributing the excess uniform to the neighbors, okay? Now, so this is the model. So what kind of questions? You can ask yourself, well, the first question, does this model stabilize, or when? Does the model stabilize? Okay. Um, then, ah, wait, before I, uh, oh, sorry, before I go to the question, let's introduce uh, two other things, uh, because they will enter the question. So, so this is the basic model, and then what we want to look at is actually, we want to look at, at the so-called odometer function. Function u, which is just defined as follows. So ut at x is just the total amount of mass which is exiting x up to time t. Okay, so I'm counting until, so for example here, t is one, so here mass, uh, at this point um, mass four exited, but at time one here at this point nothing exited yet. Okay, and then so you, you are accumulating the total amount of mass which exited at each point. 
Now you can imagine that well, this is the driving equations which you can write down. So you can express actually then the configuration after time t at each x as the initial one. This is the initial configuration. Um, plus the graph Laplacian, which we encountered before, of ut minus 1x. Okay? Oh, okay, I would like to write it like in this way. Minus uh, 1 x, which is, so this is just uh, some, so I'm normalizing it um, of y nearest neighbor to x u t minus 1, y minus u t minus 1, x. So this is for the nearest neighbor case. Okay, so for the, for the nearest neighbor case, you can easily express the configuration after time t as the initial one, plus I'm adding and subtracting everything which was flowing in and flowing out. Okay? So you can imagine what... Now you can guess what happens for the long range case. Because at the end you can, um, you can uh, interpret this thing as the transition probability of a random, simple random walk on ZT. So if the long range case is, so, so the distribution is corresponding to a long range random walk, well then we can express this distribution rule which is hidden here via an according Laplacian. And this will be the fractional Laplacian, okay? So this will be described by this kind of object. So this is for the long range case. Um, so again, you have the same property, but now the distribution rule, so, so this uh, object is a bit more complicated because uh, it's defined as follows. So you have sum over y's in z d p z d n um, you have your p alpha x minus y f y minus f x and this p n p n x minus y uh, or p x Let's say the jump from 0 to x is just depending on the distance to x. And just defined, okay, so we have some normalizing constants. And you're summing over all z these uh, apart 0, which are equal to x modulo my torus. And then you have to look at the minus d minus alpha, or minus d plus alpha. Okay, so this is the long range random walk. So you have, you see here the distance plays a role and since I'm on the torus, I have somehow to um, include, yeah, so, so to, to model this thing on the discrete torus because, and later I have to take a scaling limit, so I have to define this in this way, okay? All right, so you have here an additional parameter alpha, which is, play, which is, uh, um, modeling the long range. So how much long range am I? Okay, so the larger alpha, the shorter range I am because it means I'm distributing more mass among each neighbors than if alpha is uh, uh, small. All right, now I can ask my question. For example, okay, this one I could ask before, but the second one involves the odometer function because you see, um, so this, this is a nice positive function. It's a map. Mm v to r plus. And it is, it is collecting, at each time step, is collecting the mass which was emitted from your sites. Um, so if you can imagine if your uh, configuration will stabilize at some point, then this function will uh, actually depict a very nice interface model. So you want to know and understand, so what is the law? U infinity, say it exists. And then third question, um, so what is, so how does infinity look like 
like from a distance, so microscopically, So here I'm talking about scaling. Okay? okay. So to answer the first question, so this was done by some previous work of Lionel. Um, sorry if I'm moving. Uh, 2016, where they proved that if my graph is infinite and my initial configuration I ID with mean smaller than one, then S will stabilize. Otherwise not. And if V is finite, then we have a condition stating that if the total amount of mass is equal to the volume, then, uh, then stabilize, stabilizes total amount of mass is equal to the volume. Okay? Sorry. Equal or smaller to the volume. Okay. Um, so we know under which conditions we have to place ourselves in order to ensure that it stabilizes. And stabilization means that at some, so for every, so stabilization means for every x that the sx is smaller than equal to 1, or equivalently that the odometer is finite. So in, at some point it stops to add mass, okay? Um, so imagine we place ourselves in like a good condition so we know it will stabilize. Now what can we say about the law of this uh, surface which comes out of the odometer? <coughs> so there was some results. So I want to we rate this by LNPU, by Lionel, and this is Supriani Hazra. This was published in 17, right? Um, so we proved that if you are precisely at um, the critical points so where precisely the mass is precisely equal to the volume, then S stabilizes to the all one configuration. And the law, so U infinity or U or U, just U. Um, is in law equal to some funk, some uh, risk, so some v minus its minimum. Um, where the v, uh, where the x is just equal to one over two d y in uh, no. Okay, like, uh, okay, I would say that. You have the G, X, Y, S, Y, minus X, minus 1. Um, so, okay. Let's um, write this and then comment in a moment. Uh, so, Y is. Um, okay, um, and the U solves um, this equation, so delta U is equal to 1 minus S, and minimum U is equal to 0, 
respectively the fractional version. Okay, and then just just make, tell me, let me tell you quick what these G's are. So the G um, X Y is just um, like the average of like the Green's functions Z in uh, my V um, G Z X comma Y, where G Z x comma y is something we saw before in Rajat's talk, so it's just the expected value of a random walk starting at x and hitting y before being killed at z. Some random walk equal to y, and you to stop it before being killed in z, and then you average over all z. So for the nearest neighbor case, so this is the nearest neighbor case. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, because long range. Yeah, this one. This is for the nearest neighbors. So this is uh, because, yeah, you have the normal Laplacian. Right? Yeah. Is all? All? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So you have, and so at criticality, you have that your uh, you know that your uh, configuration will stabilize to the flat all one configuration, and you know that more or less the odometer is distributed uh, like this V. And it is solving as a unique solution of this uh, equation, this discrete equation. Okay. So how can you imagine that? So imagine you have your initial configuration starting with like some masses and some holes, and imagine you're shaking the system around so particles will flow or will flow up and down, and so we're filling up the holes, and it will uh, stop and when until I have like a really flat surface around one because my critical point, uh, my critical uh, mass is chosen to be one, right? Um, okay, so, uh, yes, so this is like the discrete uh, distribution. So let us look now at some heuristics and try to answer question two, or try to guess uh, question three, sorry. So what about the scaling? Okay, so we have seen that the odometer U is more or less solving this equation, right? So it's the inverse Laplacian. Okay, let's say we are in the nearest neighbor case. Uh, so the inverse Laplacian applied to one minus my configuration. So let's say, so assume now I'm starting with this initial configuration, so it's one plus some sigma minus the uh, one over the volume and all the values on my torus, where the sigmas are iid, and let's for the moment assume that they are standard normals. Okay? Now, what do I have here? I have roughly, um, so this is roughly, the delta minus one, inverse Laplacian, this good inverse Laplacian, applied to like a sum of roughly IID normals. Okay? So you can guess this will take some work, but you can guess, well, if I'm taking now the scaling limit, then this should converge to something like that. Right? 
So, the, so discrete one, we saw that it converges to uh, the continuous one, and then the sum of standard uh, IID standard normals, more or less, should converge to white noise. So in the continuum, this object, this is like the chef formal notation, is formally also known as the, which also we saw in Ronald's talk, bi Laplacian or membrane model. Membrane in the continuum. Okay? So now let me give a little intermezzo. Um, so into the this fraction Gaussian fields, fields which are formally denoted um, by it was in the, article, the review article of Sheffield Lodia et al. by alpha half applied to white noise, where alpha is some parameter. Okay. Um, and special cases we encountered. So for alpha is equal to minus, and for alpha is equal to one, we find the GFF, the Gaussian free field, and alpha equal to two, we just saw it's the membrane. Okay? Um, and all alphas in between are of regularity between uh, the GFF and the membrane. So the alpha is giving you somehow the regularity. The larger the alpha, the smoother the surface is, if you were to, uh, um, like depicted, like said in the okay? <coughs> um, all right. Okay, uh, right. So we find, okay, so we find roughly what um, Leinen in his paper uh, conjectured that if you start from, so it, it is, um, uh, yeah, it comes also if you see the discrete uh, law of the U and you apply it to like the sum of IID normals, then it is, uh, you can see that this should come out. The conjecture was that, well, actually it should be true for all sigmas which are um, not, not, not only normals but which have finite variance. Okay? On the conjecture, you was that the should be the scaling limit for sigmas uh, such that the variance is finite. Okay, actually, uh, to be uh, honest, you, um, the conjecture was on RD, and we were not able to prove that. We were able to prove that on the torus, though. Uh, so, yeah, so, so the, the, the uh, first theorem, which I would like to present in a minute, is actually uh, proving this conjecture. So, assuming that my initial configuration is of this form, you see um, this form is special because it automatically ensures that I'm satisfying this condition. Okay, that the total sum is equal to the volume. And, <coughs> uh, yeah, and then uh, that, uh, okay, like using this form, it should roughly be intuitive that this uh, field should come out. Okay? Um, yes, so before I state the theorem, let me just give you a brief like, overview of the whole zoo of <laughs> limiting fields that we obtained. Well, it was so much fun that we couldn't stop. <laughs> and uh, the zoo of fields, of limiting fields, which we obtained. So, um, okay, so for sigmas uh, with a finite variance, variance plus nearest neighbor. Uh, we showed uh, that in law 
This was the Cipriani Hazra, and the 17th first one goes to the Blier Plasia. Okay, so the membrane model. All right. Then, uh, okay, then we did Sigma's uh, Habitat. Um, the test, yes, I will state the theorem with the test function and everything. I just want to give you an intuition, okay? Uh, so the sigma is heavy tape plus nearest neighbor. Then we proved with the same authors, it appeared in 18, maybe, yeah, that this goes to an alpha stable distribution. And note, this is not Gaussian. Uh, now, four, two, and three. Now, then we studied sigmas with finite variance plus long range. So you, you are keeping the finite variance, but you are you changing the distribution rule. Then you get with Chiarini, Yara. Uh, 2018, that this is converging, okay, the long range with respect to alpha, and this is converging to something like that, which, where um, the gamma is the minimum between alpha and two. Um, so two remarks here, so it, in, so it includes like a whole range of uh, functional distribution, including the membrane, also including the GFF, so we can construct with our sun piles the Gaussian free field on the torus. Um, and also the other interesting thing is that uh, even if you make alpha very large, so the surface, yeah, the corresponding uh, surface very smooth, you cannot go beyond the regularity of a beta plasion. So even if this is very large, or the, the, the like maximum uh, gamma will be two. So then we ask ourselves, okay, but how can we make smoother surfaces? And then you have to, <coughs> ah, sorry, I should say, those are all, um, those sigmas are all IID. Uh, so for making smoother surfaces, we have to make the sigmas heavily correlated, okay? So the sigmas, let's say, uh, Gaussian with some correlation kernel plus nearest neighbor gives you this is Cipriani graph myself in 2018. Will give you uh, fields minus four. Which, uh, so this is one part of the result. The result is more general, but like this is one implication that you can obtain fields which are actually smoother. So um, you see, so we can really obtain the whole range of uh, limiting fields. We know exactly where, from which sun it comes from, what you have to vary, um, and we know what breaks the Gaussianity, because all those fields are Gaussian with a certain um, covariance structure, which is determined by this uh, gamma. Um, but this one is not. So this one is really, um, yeah, it's, it's an alpha stable distribution, like uh, a random distribution on the torus, so this one is really absolutely not Gaussian. Okay? All right. So just to show you my table, <laughs> um, yes, for this thing, uh, ah, here, yes, yes, um, I will show you in an example, so how to make it, uh, to make it uh, bigger than one, yeah. So let me state the theorems. So this was two, three, theories. I'd like to state the, the first two and then tell you something about the last two like in a moment. Um, so this is the first one. Um, so let's. Um, okay, so we have our initial sandbank configuration on this form. Then you have sigmas 
uh, iid with zero mean and variance one. Um, then define formal field called it psi n x for x my discrete torus in my uh, continuum torus s over z in just a discretized continuum torus sized torus um, of u n times z um, indicator that x is in the ball of radius z with uh, of um, uh, middle point z and radius 1 over uh, to n. Uh, then define this, the like scaling which we have to perform this of order this is now the, yeah, the new neighbor case. So d minus 4 over 2. Then a n x i n will converge to this object, okay, or something like uh, xi, where this xi is a random distribution, so it's a collection of I applied to test functions where f come from some large f, which consists of all c infinity functions on the torus uh, with mean zero. Okay. Um, yes. Just tell you about the Bilaplacian field. So, just a remark. So, this Bilaplacian field, Xi, um, actually applied to um, some test function is a normal distribution with this variance. Um, so, F2 minus 1 can be also written as um, delta minus 1 F squared in L2, um, which is just the sum over Z, ZD of uh, Z the minus 4, F, Z hat. Okay? So you have um, the, like the operator hidden in here. So this tells you that it's coming from a nearest neighbor um, distribution or here. Okay. Um, yes. Now the other theory I would like to mention. So this is the uh, Chiarini Milton and eighteen is this long range case. So we are starting. Okay. So those uh, assumptions will be equal, um, but we are yeah we have this long range distribution, and then what will change is of course the. Um, the, the, the scaling factor because it's, it is not anymore um, like uniform for all alpha d minus 4 over 2 but it will depend on alpha so you have two assumptions as before assumptions on s as before plus you have a n alpha is equal to um, you have uh, n to the d minus 2 alpha over 2. Yes, if alpha is smaller than 1, then you have this for 2, then log n. And if alpha is equal to 2, and you have the Laplacian scaling if alpha is larger than 2. Okay? Um, ah, just let me mention that this, this uh, convergence in law is happening in some appropriate Sobolev space. Some Sobolev space. Huh? All right. And then you have, okay, then this, this alpha 
and now the corresponding long range field will co converge to something like that. And alpha two. Yeah? Okay. Let me give you just some ideas of the proof. Um, okay, well, how much time? Have I? Oh, okay. Um, yes, 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 yes. All right. Um, so first of all, you want to ask yourself how to guess the scaling. So what is the right, uh, yeah, what is the right uh, scaling factor a n I have to look at, uh, depending on the model. So for this, let us look at, so for x, y in uh, CDN, my discretized torus, I'm looking at the covariance. Of um, oops, not comma times of my point um, x and with y, which is equal to the um, convolution of these two Green's functions. Okay, so if I want to go now to Fourier space, which is very helpful, then I will get n to the minus d z. Okay, and I'm getting extra factor. Um, and if I'm now expanding in um, eigenvalues, then I will get this is minus d now of some z of exponential 2 pi i of x minus y n times z over the square of the uh, eigenvalues. And now for the nearest neighbor case, we know that roughly this goes like z over n squared. And for the long range case, they are a bit more complicated. But um, let's say for okay, alpha smaller than 2, it's the interesting case, they go like z over n to the 2 alpha. Uh, sorry, to the alpha. Okay, so replacing this here, what do we get? We get that this is more or less, um, you get an n, n squared, so n to the four, so you have n to the four minus d, and you get two x, two pi e i x minus y, and z over uh, z, four. Okay, so you see from this, Factor, you can um, deduce that the right scaling should be the square root of this. And then you can also guess, well, if I replace the 2 now by an alpha, then the right scaling should be uh, here to alpha, which I have also here. Okay? So this is the first step. The second step. At least for the Gaussian cases, we know that the moments will exist. So we could use a moment method to, um, yeah, to, to look at the convergence of all the moments and to determine that the moments converge to the right ones. So by a method of moments, moments, we can prove that actually, so the field, so the moments of this random variable converge to the right ones, namely that you want that this is equal to 2n minus 1 double factorial, and then your norm, let's say we're in the nearest neighbor case of m is even, and 0 of m is odd. Okay? 
So let's just look at the second moment and you will see what kind of uh, uh, things will pop out. So the second moment, okay, I have to look at a n times f square, uh, squared, so this will give me an a n squared, and this will give me some z z prime f z f z prime, and then the covariance of the youths. Uh, ah, sorry, I forgot one step. Wait, let me. Uh, da, da, da. Yes, yes. Let me let me do this in one minute. So let's just first look at what this looks like. Okay. So this is my U um, A N U N Z, and then actually you have the integral y uh, over the ball uh, one over two n dy. Okay, so actually, so this is equal to that, and then what you do is you split it. z and you get an extra factor uh, minus get an extra minus factor yes uh, plus some rest okay so okay you don't see anything a n n to the minus d okay so now if you look at the second moment Uh, what you get? You get a n squared, you get n to the minus 2 d, and you get, so if I just look at the first term, and then I have, of course, to show that the uh, remainder will not matter, um, you get z z prime u n z, uh, no, sorry, f z f z prime u n z uh, u n z prime plus some rest, okay? All right, so we just have seen that this is more or less equal to this factor, which is uh, one, which will be killed by this one times that. And if you replace that, then you will see that um, this is, okay, so D, um, F. Prime, okay, small s. Uh, then you want to skip, yeah, okay. Uh, and then sum over uh, w as well, z minus z prime, w over w to the four, and then there will be like some work depending on, okay, so this is for the nearest neighbor class. If you have uh, the long range, of course, you have this other um, eigenvalues which will play a role. And now, so the, the work now is to prove that this, for example, the second moment is converging to the right thing, which is the sum over z in zd minus zero, f z squared over z to the four, okay? Which is precisely the norm squared which we want relative suburb of space. And you see, okay, so this is for the second moment. You can imagine for the third moment, you can do something like similar. So um, you are dividing your integral in the middle point and then the rest, and then you're controlling the rest that this doesn't matter. And you say that, okay, that actually this concentrated around the middle point will give me the right, um, yeah, so it gives me the, the correct contribution, uh, which will converge to the, yeah, to the right order of uh, the moments. Okay, um, all right, yes. So maybe I can just give you like a, a motivation for the third one. Okay. So because if you look uh, now at uh, this second moment, right? So if, uh, remember that the third one, assume that we're starting from normals, so it is enough to control the variance and to show that the variance is converging to the right object. So what does the variance look like? It looks more or less like that. So if we want to 
Uh, now produce a field which is like smoother than the Laplacian, so it means that I have to kill somehow uh, or to add here a power of uh, z, uh, of the norm of z. So imagine, okay, we have just a remark about the third object. Because, because, <laughs> It came from the idea that, well, how about we reverse engineer, so we, we are pre first defining the field we are aiming at, and then we reverse engineer and uh, construct the corresponding covariance for the, uh, for the Gaussian, which has to be taken in order to get the field we want, right? So um, somehow we are playing then with the limiting Sobolev space where this object is living. Uh, all right, so if, for example, you want, you want something, uh, so assume my covariance kernel is such that the Fourier transform is equal to uh, xi minus 4 delta, and delta is some positive parameter. Then, what happens if I look at uh, xi f at my, let's say, a and at my sums of z prime f Z, Z prime, and then um, I'm taking, so I'm saying this is more or less, it's roughly, yeah, so delta minus 1 sigma x and uh, delta minus 1 sigma y, uh, roughly, then this will be roughly delta minus 2 covariance kernel between k and x, like uh, between x and y, sorry, yeah? So if this, the covariance kernel has this Fourier transform, you know that this is corresponding to the Laplacian of minus two delta. Okay, at x, y. So it means that in the end, this thing will converge to f to delta, so Laplacian, minus two, uh, one plus delta f, in A2. Okay. Uh, and since data is uh, bigger than uh, zero, this one plus something positive is smoother than the Laplacian, than the B Laplacian field. Okay. So this, this will be smoother than the B Laplacian. All right, uh, yeah, so maybe it's a good point to stop. Ah, no, sorry, before I stop, I would like to make a list of open questions. Um, and, yeah, ah, and before, maybe make a remark about habitat, which I unfortunately could not talk about. So this, the, the habitat case, you, you can imagine you have to approach with a completely different method because you don't have moments. So there you really have to control uh, the distribution on the level of characteristic functionals and uh, prove that this is going to the character's function of an alpha-stable distribution. So it's, uh, it's really um, involves much different techniques here. Um, and this nice example where it shows where really Gaussianity can break, because you see the long-rangeness doesn't break it. Really, the assumptions on the moments of the sigmas will break it. Okay? So let me then finish with some open questions. Okay, so we didn't prove the origin conjecture. We proved uh, like something which uh, we could prove. And um, so the, still the open question is what happens on RD? So DSM on RD, okay? 
So there you have, um, of course, to control our two things. So the really growth of the space, we have now a compact space, so this uh, we are using also. So the growth of the process and the growth of the space at the same time. And uh, so can we, find, can we find a way to control it in a good way such that we can get um, the, the scaling limit on RD? The second one, oh, you're very, oh, ah, this is my, uh, oh, we executed. So uh, connections, connections to the ASM. So the divisible sand pile is, uh, yeah, it's a continuous sand pile model, so continuous height model, and it has no dissipation. So it's, um, it is related, it's like a system model of the ASM, but not completely. But are there connections to the uh, abelian sand pile model? Since, for example, we know what also Rajat mentioned that of the work of Lola, Sun and Wu, that um, like the spanning trees uh, in D bigger than four, they are converging, so probably rescaled towards the Bila Plaschen. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence of uh, sandpile models and spanning trees. So there should be maybe also connection, or what is the connection to the original uh, um, abelian sandpile model? Uh, then the, also what happens, what happens for really in the subcritical case? So we assumed always that we're at criticality because we knew at criticality we were stabilized to the all one configuration. This was very helpful. You see the um, equation we had to solve, no, it's not there yet, I can maybe write it, was of the form, so the odometer equation was of this form, where this is the final configuration. If we are starting now um, with a configuration which is subcritical, with, we know we will stabilize, but we don't know to what. So this will be in the subcritical case give you something like that, like the final minus the uh, original one, and they will be heavily correlated. But how much and what kind of distribution this, this will give is also not known. And then, um, yeah, just uh, popped this morning, like the synchronization for DSM what Daniel was uh, talking about. So is in this case um, the fact that we have continuous heights helping or not? Because if for finding this odometer function, it was, uh, it was crucial that it, it, we, ha we are dealing with continuous functions, so it was helping in the sense to find the limiting distribution. So the synchronization phenomena, I don't know, does it help or not? Is it more difficult? What can we expect? We also get like devil staircases or not? And then the last one, I would uh, really like to understand more the connection Obstacle problems. So this connection was used also very heavily in the proofs uh, for the limiting shape, and uh, um, so that you can so you, you can translate the um, uh, the odometer problem into solving a, some kind of variation problem, which is also called this obstacle problem. Um, but can we do this for the subcritical case? So there should be a obstacle problem here behind, but what kind of obstacle? So is this method maybe useful uh, to solve question two? It's also open. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, maybe have some answers to this. Yes. Other questions? If not, let's thank Valeta again.